Hi, I'm Kat Powers at the Somerville Media Center, and we're here with Counselor at Large, Willie Burnley Jr. Hello. Nice to have you. Well, <laughs> thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, how is it being a city councilor? It is amazing, actually, in the strangest of ways. You know, people um, out of nowhere will talk to you and say, hey, I got this problem. I need to get this permit. I need uh, help getting recycling. I had someone call me earlier today, who used to be a professor of mine in college, actually, talking to me about uh, rental issues she was having with a landlord. Um, and you have the opportunity every single day to make someone's life a little bit better, uh, which is something I really appreciate as someone who seeks purpose in life and likes to help people. So what are the big issues that you came in? Well, you came in on a number of big issues on this most recent election. You were one of uh, eight vying for the seat. You were one of four actually sitting in, in those seats now. Uh, you, you had a pretty big platform. Where do you start? Yes, I did. And uh, I was pushing for ambitious plans as someone who has faced displacing myself in this city, as someone who's been on the front lines of racial justice struggles. Uh, I was fighting for more funding for affordable housing. I was fighting for more uh, police accountability in this city. Uh, and for more equity at large in terms of accessibility, uh, government transparency, all these sorts of things, under the guise that we actually can make progress on these, what seem like at times unmovable issues. As long as we actually have the people with us, if we can build mass movements, and if we can channel that energy where it is most effective. Sometimes that means city hall, sometimes it means the mayor, sometimes that means the state house. Uh, but I believe that we can actually concretely improve people's lives um, once we get people involved in fighting for the right things. So you're starting with equity. Uh, you are basically, and, and this, is, this is boiling it down to its essence, this is an equity study that you are, you are looking for? Yes. Explain. Yes. So one of the first orders that I put into the council uh, was for a disparity study to be done by our city. Um, and just to break that down a little bit, what a disparity study is, is it looks at the, the purchasing, uh, the contracts that the city has, um, saying who we contract with, um, who, what services they're doing, um, who owns those businesses, and it breaks it down in terms of race, it breaks it down in terms of gender, and it sees if we can actually be spending our public dollars um, advancing equity to make sure that businesses owned by people of color, businesses owned by women, businesses owned by LGBTQ people, if we uh, choose to, to gather that data, um, are actually being served by this city um, as much as their whiter or more male uh, counterparts. Um, and this is not something that I came up with on my own. Um, the city of Boston did this a few years back, and they found that uh, under the first uh, term of the Walsh administration over a four-year period, um, that there was a huge inequity in terms of which businesses were being served by the public dollars of that city. Um, I think the numbers off the top of my head are 1.1% of Asian-owned businesses were, received city contracts that were able to get them, 0.8% uh, of Latino-owned businesses received these contracts, and 0.4%. Um, that is less than one half of 1% of black owned businesses uh, received city contracts to perform services. And it's not because there weren't enough of these businesses to do the work, which is something that a disparity study looks at. It was because they weren't um, chosen to get these contracts. Or, now, once you have those numbers, it's presumed that you can then do something about it. Do we have any numbers in Somerville? Has, has there been a, dis, a disparity study in the past? Well, that's a great uh, question, and it's something that I've been pursuing through city staff um, and asking around about. Um, as far as I know, as far as anyone has told me who's been in this city, um, there has not been one. And to be fair, when Boston did their recent disparity study, it was the first time in 18 years that uh, they had done it. Um, and, but unfortunately, Somerville is really behind the, the curve on this issue. Um, I was speaking to city staff on this last night in a city council meeting. Um, 
I asked, for example, how much do we as a city annually um, spend on contracts, on procurement? Uh, for Boston, that number is about $560 million a year. Um, for Somerville, they couldn't give me an answer in that meeting, which was unfortunate. Um, part of the issue is that we have not been doing a good job over many years of tracking this data. Um, some of the contracts are, have been on paper, or they're not digitized. Um, mm -hmm. And part of the work of doing a disparity study would be the compiling of all this information so we can have a full economic picture of the city's services. And then, as you said, be able to improve upon those numbers um, and make sure that we are operating in an equitable way. Your disparity study, does that study everybody the city has contracts with? Does it need to be people or businesses within Somerville that then contract with the city? Is there, how, how, do, you, how do you want folks to look at this? Well, it's a, we want to get broad data here. Um, because we want to be as clear about what's happening as possible. Um, and there are all sorts of services that the city contracts out for. Sometimes it's construction, sometimes it's, you know, purchasing masks. Where one of the other orders that we put forward on the council was for the city to procure more masks um, during this crisis of the pandemic. Um, but we don't want to do a minor limited study because we need to understand more broadly how we're um, pulling in contracts because we're pulling not just within Somerville but much more broadly in the, our community and it would be unwise for us to um, say well for all the contracts we're pulling from uh, Cambridge or Chelsea or Medford those aren't we're not going to look at those um, they're a part of our broader community as well and we need to be really mindful about how our dollars are affecting the broader um, constituency. Are there other massive, Boston's huge, right? We are not even half the size of Boston. So are there other communities our size that have done this sort of study? Well, that's something that city staff has been investigating. Um, mm -hmm. And for the most part, it seems like not really. Um, we, one of the avenues that we're pursuing right now is seeing if we can uh, partner with other communities to commission a broader disparity study that looks at each individual city, of course, or town, um, but also um, has a little bit of money pitched in from each place so that we can have a comparative one as well. Mm -hmm. Because as I said before, some of these contracts are not with just within Somerville, and they may actually be um, vendors that the city of uh, Medford is uh, partnering with or Brookline is partnering with. So um, I've been reaching out to other uh, elected leaders across the region as well to see if they are interested in this uh, because uh, it would need to be approved by their uh, elected bodies as well. Um, but we're pursuing different paths so that we can make sure that um, we have this information um, but we're not just comparing apples to oranges in, ter in terms of our economic uh, size. What is Boston doing with the information that they pulled together? Now, they pulled together the information uh, in 2019 under Mayor Walsh, who is no longer there. What is Boston doing with this information now? Yes, and this is one of the key reasons why doing a disparity study is important. Um, under our state laws, there are only certain policies that you can advance once you've done a study like this. Um, and so after the study was done, uh, we had, obviously Boston had a lot of, a lot of uh, mayoral races, it felt like. Um, and it has a new mayor now, Michelle Wu, who very, very early in her term uh, put forward uh, a letter to the council asking them to um, approve what is called a sheltered market program. What that is is a, a race conscious policy that says we're going to put aside a certain amount of our dollars as a city that we use for purchasing for a certain amount of contracts just for uh, businesses owned by people of color or businesses owned by women. Um, and so Boston is now uh, putting aside enough for six contracts, specifically four. Um, people of color and women, and using that to you know, bolster their numbers. 
obviously six out of what is probably hundreds of contracts in their case is not uh, going to entirely shift the scale, but it's one policy that can be advanced um, once you have your actual data on this, which is something that I would love to see the city of Somerville have. Boston's new mayor is neither white nor male. Is It may be presumed that she would be uh, advancing this issue. Uh, it, that might not be true. What are things that Somerville could do that we see her doing? Well, the disparity study is one so that we can maybe explore doing a sheltered market program where we um, look at that, but also more broadly say, what is our process currently? Uh, how much of it is what is considered uh, race neutral? Um, once we have a study, we can consider whether we need to be doing more prioritization of contracts. Um, we can also, something we're doing now is just doing more tracking, quite frankly, of which vendors we're contracting with, um, what certifications they have, so that we can have a better picture of who the city is working with and where we're spending people's tax dollars. Um, and I am very interested in pursuing as many different avenues as possible so that we can support our local businesses here um, and more broadly in our greater community. You're also building on the work of other counselors. What other work has been done in this regard? Well, in 2019, uh, when Boston put forward the study, there was also a big call in our community for a study like this. Um, ben Ewan Campen and then Councillor Ben Ewan Campen, who uh, who uh, represents the area, but it's literally a stone's throw from this studio. Actually, I'm in uh, JT Scott's ward, ward yes. two. Yes. You are sitting in Ben Ewan Campen's ward. Oh, really? Believe it or not, the dividing line goes through this room. Well, there you go. So not even a stone's throw. We're right here, uh, or at least I am. Um, but he put forward a resolution with then Councillor uh, Will Mba um, for a disparity study. Um, it was supported um, not just within the council, but by BECMA, that is the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, and the Welcome Project here locally. Um, they put forward letters to the city council, then president, uh, now mayor, uh, Katiana Ballantyne was, uh, it, those letters were addressed to, um, saying the city of Somerville should do a disparity study and move forward with this. Um, that was going on three years ago. Um, and we still have not done it. So something that I am very interested in is making sure that we pursue this doggedly, that we do not uh, take our foot off the gas on this for any longer and actually get some results so that we can point to the data and see how we're going to improve it. So you're new to the council. You've probably very quickly come, caught up to speed on how things are done. This, this, these orders are kind of written funny. The order to the Director of Economic Development and the Director of Procurement and Contracting Services, it, the, it's, it's telling them to take orders. So why does the counselor end up telling the mayor's staff how to do their job? Well, that's a, a great question. And it's not uh, a you do this because we sell you, tell you through thing. It is just the way that the the process and the procedures are written out. What the council is able to do is we are able to put forward ordinances, that is laws, uh, as everyone knows, um, resolutions, which are statements of support, um, and orders, which are directing uh, city staff to come before the council and explain something, uh, set forward uh, operations on a certain thing. Oftentimes you'll see orders that um, that a certain department like install a light sign or in, uh, make some improvements to infrastructure in a certain area. Um, it's a way for the council to have input and make sure that their constituents' voices are heard on particular issues that affect them. All right. So I, I know that uh, before coming here today, had a little bit of fun on social media talking about um, uh, is it was it just businesses owned by people of color? No, and women. And women. Somerville. So what what kind of businesses uh, are we talking about celebrating here? Well, it's it was actually such a great uh, experience to do this um, because you know I live here, I I eat here, I have a great time here, um, but there's still so much of the community that I've yet to experience, um, and so. When I reached out on social media earlier today to say, hey, please just shout out your favorite 
businesses owned by people of color or women. I got so many recommendations for great food, some in this neighborhood. Um, a lot of restaurants, um, including, you know, there's a Tipping Cow, one I put forward, which is ice cream. Uh, ice cream. Which, you know, it's great. There was And vegan ice cream, by the vegan way. Vegan ice cream. Yes, and there was actually uh, someone put me on to a new restaurant, I believe, in Somerville um, called, that is um, Egyptian vegan food, street food. Oh, wow. Um, and I, I, I'm very uh, excited to try it. They just had a piece about it actually in the Somerville Wire. So, you know, shout out some more Somerville uh, media bodies. Um, but also beyond just food, there were, you know, Pearl Street Tattoos, which just opened up, a tattooing shop owned by a woman of color um, and an immigrant. Uh, a curl bar, which is a, a hair salon uh, in East Somerville. Um, there's a, this one didn't get shouted out, but I'm gonna shout them out, Vilside um, Customs, which is a printing shop mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. And so there's wine, there was food. It actually, all the things just made me think about maybe putting together like an event where we uh, have a date night in Somerville um, that celebrates these businesses and points them to say, first you can go get some food, then you can go get a bottle of wine, and depending our, on where you are in your uh, relationship, maybe you can get matching tattoos um, and celebrate uh, many of the great businesses in our community. Um, it's just been a good experience for me to be able to highlight these things because I've had some of these business owners have immediately just reached back out and said thank you because they really needed it during this time. Um, so many folks have lost money during COVID and have had struggles keeping their doors open. So as much as we can do as a community to support them, I'm in favor of. So, and this is where we had talked earlier about how I'm gonna ask you the stupid questions. Why, uh, why do studies about how many uh, folks of color and women are uh, having uh, contracts with the city or are uh, go through the procurement uh, process to become a vendor to the city? Why do that? Because I believe that racial justice is economic justice. And as I was just saying, we need to be doing as much as we possibly can to be supporting the businesses in Somerville, but more broadly, we need to be concerned about where our public dollars go. Um, and as a city, I believe that our, our budget is, you know, a moral document about our values. And I believe where we actually spend our money shows us where our values are. And if we can spend our money in a way that is advancing racial justice and equity, then we should be doing that. During this time when uh, a number of us are working from home, uh, we're here in the, the SCAT building, the Somerville Media Center studios, but a number of folks are working from home. And now you can work from anywhere in a number of jobs. Mm -hmm. If you work for the city, do you need to be a resident of Somerville, do you believe? I don't believe you need to be, but I believe that it helps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I talk to folks, for example, in our mobility department, and these are the folks who make sure that our streets are safe. They're the ones who are making changes, putting speed bumps, doing all the things that are trying to make sure that when you walk outside that you are safe, that you're not gonna get hit by a car. Um, and I personally believe that walking our streets every day, living on these, in these conditions, if you bike like me and going down some of these roads that are uh, a little cracked up, have a few potholes, it will really inform your perspective on the prioritization of work that needs to be done here. So I am sure there are roles um, in this city that can be done by people who live outside of it. Um, and, I, and to be honest, the unaffordability of our community makes it very difficult for some of our employees to live here. I think especially of our teachers. But when you actually live here, it really, I think, brings a much more holistic view of the work that needs to be done in the community that is uh, trying to enjoy their lives here as much as possible. If you are a vendor with the city, should you get um, preferences if your business is based in Somerville? Well, I think that that's something that we can talk about. And I've and it's one of the reasons we need more data about this. Mm -hmm. um, some of our data that we have um, 
is on paper, it's not digitized, which makes it incredibly difficult to actually um, have a complete picture of because people would need to spend hours upon hours searching file cabinets and you know collating things. Um, I would love to have a complete picture of what businesses we, in our city that we are contracting with, which businesses that we aren't, we, that we could be, and uh, figuring out how to maximize um, the impact there. Because the more we can spend the city's dollars within the city of Somerville, the more that the folks who are living here and working here will be replenished and able to have more stability in their lives. So we still have a few minutes left. You're, this isn't the only issue you've been working on as counselor. No, it's What not. else you got going on? Well, we're doing a lot right now um, around public safety. Um, there are a few conversations that the council has been having around this. Much of it has been had about the public safety building that's being considered um, mm -hmm. in East Somerville. That would be a more than $100 million building, primarily for uh, police and fire. Um, and there has been a, a strong reaction from the community around Again, where we're putting our money and what it tells us about our values. Right now, in the midst of this pandemic, while so many people have uh, been behind on rent, are struggling to find affordable housing, should we be, in, and to be clear, borrowing $100 million that we will have to pay back over a course of one to two to three decades, mm -hmm. um, millions of dollars at a time, for uh, 50% of the building would be parking for their vehicles. Um, or should we be investing that money into constructing more housing for folks? Should we be making sure that that food insecure area of our community has more um, food access? Um, what can $100 million do for Somerville? If we're gonna borrow it, which would need to come through the council, we need to be very sure that we're maximizing the impact there. Um, so that's one aspect of it. We also just had a vote um, in the council where we turned down a grant actually for traffic stop enforcement uh, because that grant that the our Somerville Police Department uh, applied for came with a quota and it said if you're gonna take this money you need to at least be doing three stops per hour in the areas that uh, this grant would be impacting we do nowhere near that level of enforcement currently and so it would to to take that in good faith would, would mean to be uh, increasing enforcement by a measure of, I think, six times in some of those areas, in my view, arbitrarily. Um, and so the council actually voted down that grant for the first time in at least 10 years. Um, and I was proud to be one of the people who voted down because I don't believe quotas in law enforcement actually lead to better results. Not taking a grant for the police not voting to go ahead and build a new police or, or fire station. It's police on fire, correct? Yes. Some folks are painting that as a big defund the police stance. What do you think? I think this, again, it all goes back to the conversation about advancing racial equity. If we believe that there is um, disparate impact in terms of police stops, um, which we know there is because we actually do have that data in Somerville, and for example, black people in the city of Somerville, uh, or at least moving through the city of Somerville, were the only uh, group, uh, racial group, that was stopped at higher rate than their proportion of the population in Somerville. Um, if we believe that because we have the data to back it up, then why would we uh, agree to a grant that requires us to artificially enforce that more? to say we're gonna stop more people. Because if the trends continue, all that's going to do is widen the racial divide in these matters. Um, on, the, on the issue of the public safety building, if we know that the p things that the people are talking to us the most about as counselors is how they're gonna find a home, how they're going to be able to afford to stay in Somerville, how they're gonna get food and childcare uh, and medicine for their families, then we need to be investing our money in that. And I, I'm not sure that we can do that and say that we're advancing racial equity while spending $100 million uh, on something that is going to cost us on the back end. All right. So uh, to wrap up, 
Uh, it is gorgeous outside. It's is it 60 degrees yet? It's more than 60 degrees. Ah. I biked over. It felt great. This is amazing. So we're not going to talk about the snow that's coming Friday, but we are taping this on a 60 degree day in February. It's making me think of spring. <laughs> what are the cool things to do in Somerville when it warms up? Well, when I first moved to Somerville, I lived uh, right on the line of East Somerville and at the bottom of Winter Hill on a street called Fellsway West, um, right across from Foss Park. And I loved diving into that pool every summer. Um, it's very lively. Everyone brings their kids. There's adults hanging around the pool. Um, and there's nothing like, you know, cooling off when it's when it hits 80, um, and especially when you can do it with your friends. So I'm looking forward to swimming again. Fantastic. All right, well, that wraps it up. We're in the middle of Union Square in a mini February heat wave. Uh, this has been a conversation with Councilor at Large, Willie Burnley. I'm Kat Powers at the Somerville Media Center. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.